Hi there, I'm Christine Dunbar from speechmodification.com and this is my smart American accent training. Welcome to our live Friday broadcast where we take your questions regarding American accent, pronunciation, intonation, anything I can help you with to improve your overall personal and professional communication in American English. Each week we take a topic and look at some information to help you share free resources and I always take your questions. So please feel free to ask your questions at any time in the chat. You can type your questions in and I'd be happy to answer them. I wanna to look today at a topic which is something that comes up a lot in this class, which is how to pronounce words which are difficult. So we're gonna look at some specific examples of difficult words. And we're also gonna look in general at why some words are difficult and how to handle improving your pronunciation on those words. So thank you for being here and being a part of class. If you're new to class, we hold this class every week on Fridays and you can always ask questions in the chat and also in the comments on the replay. I go back and share resources and answer those questions as well. I love having your questions and your input because it helps me know which new topics to talk about in class, which new videos to create, and which new lessons to put together for speechmodification.com, our website. So as I was saying, I wanna talk about how to pronounce difficult words. And when I'm thinking about what makes something difficult in terms of pronunciation, there are two things to consider at first. So the first consideration is maybe you don't actually know how a word is supposed to be pronounced. Um, so th that uh, if I don't know how a word is supposed to pr be pronounced, I of course need to learn what the correct pronunciation is. Or maybe I know how the word is pronounced, but I still can't do it. <laughs> um, it's just challenging, so I know, but I still can't do. Um, or I don't know. Uh, so first let's talk about when we don't know how to pronounce something, where are some resources for you? What's some help? Um, many times we might type that word into Google or use a search tool and maybe we get conflicting information or we get some information but we hear it and we have trouble remembering. We don't really have a sense for how to know what that word is. And so um, the resources that I like to use are, of course, um, my website, speechmodification.com and my YouTube channel. If you go into my YouTube channel and you're on your um, desktop, you can look on the channel page and you'll see um, that I have a search tool, a search box there that you can type into, and it will pop up all the videos related to your search. So you might just type in a word or a phrase, and you'll find that for many, many of the difficult words in English, I already have a video. Um, same goes for speechmodification.com. So when you're on the website, simply go to the free practice and use the online practice free trial. And for example, many people will ask me about the word literally, that's a challenging one. And so you can just type in your word there right in the search box and then all of the lessons and related information will pop up. So here's a lesson specifically about the word literally, here's one about other adverbs that end with L-Y or A-L-L-Y. And you'll see there's often a video and sometimes also an accompanying lesson. Um, where that fails you and maybe a first resource would be to go to an online dictionary. I like the Oxford Learner's Dictionary because it has um, very nice recordings of the words. And so oftentimes being able to listen and hear that word being pronounced correctly, that's the first step for getting it into our mind, getting it into being able to hear it. Um, also, you can type words into Google and they'll show you a pronunciation and those are usually fairly accurate. So for example, if I want to look up the word girl, um, say I have a challenge with that, I can go in and I can see um, there's the British pronunciation and the American pronunciation. So maybe I have a tendency to have more of a British English pronunciation of a certain word because of my background or because of how I was taught English. I can listen to it. Let me check and see if my volume is on here. Um, so it'll play a recording of the, the, uh, of the 
word girl and I can look at the sounds in the word and look at some differences there and maybe you can't yet read the um, symbols for the pronunciation in the dictionary that's something that we work on in this class and on my website to help you use those as useful tools they're especially good to see what the sounds are when the sounds are somewhat different than the spelling and um, so that's my first step is to kind of get some information about how the word is pronounced but then, for many people, it's really not so much about this factor. You, you know how it's supposed to be pronounced, but it's still difficult for you. So what do we do when I know how to pronounce a word, I've heard it, I, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and it's still very difficult for me? Um, so in this case, what I recommend is taking your word and breaking it down. So let's take a look at, for example, that word girl. and if I know why it's difficult for me, that's my first step. So does it have sounds that are challenging? In this case, yes, it has the R and the L together. Those are very challenging sounds. Does it have spelling that's confusing? In this case, also yes. There's the letter I in there, but there's really no I sound. In this case, the IR just sounds like er. And uh, so I, I'm aware of this, I know this information. How do I begin changing my pronunciation or learning how to say this word correctly? Um, I know it's a different co difficult combination of sounds. So usually with a short word, what I'm gonna recommend is starting with the sound that you find difficult. So for many people, the R sound in American English is difficult, just saying the er sound. If that's a struggle for you to say er, then that's where you need to begin with this word. You need to practice just on that sound er, you need to get help in how to form the R sound, how to create that. I have an American R playlist and many videos to teach you how to say the R sound. And you can also contact me here on in the chat and tell me, okay, help me with that sound. But once I can say the er sound, I can begin to focus in and build it in this word. So maybe R is no problem for me, but I still struggle with the word girl. I like to then build from one sound and add in additional sounds. So for example, for girl, I'm gonna start with er. When I can say that correctly, I'm gonna go for er, oh, oh. So I have that dark L that has the schwa sound before it. Oh, ger, or er, oh. So I'm gonna start with er, add the oh. If that's too difficult, maybe I need to start with the oh, oh, and then add the er. Or, if that's too challenging, maybe I want to start with gur, gur. Maybe I can put those sounds together. So I find the places where I can correctly make the sounds, and then I begin to build it all together. Eventually, I'm going to be able to say gur, o, gur, o, and then I run it together even more until I can finally say girl, girl. That's my, uh, um, so you'll notice here that I'm not using the spelling of the word. As soon as I look at this word with the original spelling, then whatever I was doing wrong before, whatever pronunciation I have stored in my brain and stored in my muscles is going to come out. It's harder for me to look at this word and do it the new way. So I break that down by rewriting it in a way that makes sense to my brain that reminds me of the new pronunciation patterns and allows me to do it correctly. So in this case, it might be writing it as gur o or er o and rethinking and practicing using that visual, visualizing that in my head when I'm saying the word. And then eventually I'll be able to put this word together, say it naturally and smoothly, girl. Um, once I have a word, there's then of course next steps to move from just being able to say the word to being able to use it. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but I wanna pause and answer some of your questions. And I also want to talk about um, some other words besides girl and give you more examples of how to break down the word and what's important to pay attention to when you're talking about pronouncing words. But a brief pause for your questions. Hi everybody, nice to see you. Um, Sheridan has a question related to the R sound. What are the common mistakes when it comes to the R sound? That's a great question, Sheridan. Um, what I typically hear is that um, in the beginnings of words, people will use more of a front R. So either it's the R sound from their native language 
or from another dialect of English, and it will sound more like a r. The front of the tongue is lifting, it's rolling, or it's tapping up. So red might sound like red, or in the middle of a word, very might sound like very. We're actually using a flap there with one tongue lift versus, or a roll, a red or a very. Instead of pulling the tongue back, red, very, and having the back American R. In the middle and ends of words, I'll often hear that people will substitute a schwa sound instead of an R. And in some dialects of English, this is how this sound is said. So for example, in our word girl, um, people might say it more like gull. So they'll have a schwa there instead of an er. Um, and the basic difference there is that my schwa sound is just a relaxed central tongue versus my er sound is a tight um, and tense um, sound. Or for example, on the word paper, I might hear people saying it more like paper, paper. They're using a schwa sound and having too, too relaxed of a sound at the end of the word. There are different errors depending on where the R is in the word, but in American English, no matter what, no matter where the R is, we're using the same R tongue position for that sound. There are also some people with different language backgrounds who tend to confuse the R and L sounds, especially in blends, like words like um, 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 pray and play, they may interchange those sounds. That can happen in other uh, examples as well, uh, with the L again being lifted in the front and the R being lifted in the back. Great question. Um, thank you for your, your question, Sheridan. And um, we have a question in the word cotton. Is the T a glottal stop? Um, so uh, yes and no. Um, I hesitate to use the term glottal stop. I like to call it a stopped T um, simply because if I make a glottal stop by itself, if I say cot, caught and I stop the air at the glottis or at my throat, cotton. Um, I, it's a similar sound, but for me, I will stop the air somewhere between the back of the throat and the tongue, but I definitely lift the tongue, cotton, cotton, for that T and syllabic N combination, um, because I think cotton, cotton, if I'm stopping too far back, it doesn't sound very natural to me. And I hear people making an error pattern where they're doing a glottal stop instead of a stopped T, and there's a little bit of a difference. Um, depending on how it sounds for you, uh, many people will refer to that as a glottal stop rather than a stopped T. That's just a distinction that I like to make. But yes, we don't really say the T sound. I don't say cotton um, with an aspirated T or a flap T like cotton. No, I definitely make a stopped T in that word. Great. Um, we have a question about the relationship between pitch and intonation in a simple way. Um, okay, so uh, intonation isn't exactly simple, but I do think that we can simplify it for you and give you an understanding of what pitch means in relation to intonation. Um, so pitch is uh, where my voice is. Um, in most spoken English, we have kind of a medium, a low, and a high pitch. So I might say, for example, when I greet you, I might say, um, how are you? And my pitch will go like this. How are you? It'll rise up on the stressed word and fall off. So it's kind of a two, then a three, and down here to a one. Pitch is just about how, how high or low your voice is. I can use a rising pitch. Um, I can, I can, that my pitch is going up, or a falling pitch. I can, my pitch is going down. Intonation, on the other hand, is everything I'm doing, including pitch, including how long words are, including where I'm stressing, how loud my voice is. So intonation covers the whole rules, the whole thing that's happening in terms of how I'm conveying meaning, how I'm changing words, the, the length of words and the, the um, stress of words when I'm connecting them together. Pitch just looks at how high or how low my voice is, whether it's going up or going down. Um, you can find out more about intonation and pitch. I would suggest looking at my intonation playlist 
or you can search again on speechmodification.com. If you go into my free practice, you'll see um, that you can search um, here on the in the categories. You can look at the intonation lessons, and it's going to bring up all of the lessons regarding intonation. So here's just a general uh, um, lesson about the music of English intonation. Here's some specific words and challenges. Um, here's some um, information about statements, uh, using pitch, um, and other relevant information for intonation. So thank you for the question. Uh, hi, Darlene, nice to see you. We have a question. Um, um, about the words pudding and pudding, and do they sound the same? Um, so pudding, like I'm putting on my shoes, or pudding, uh, I'm eating some pudding. Um, so they both have a flap sound. So this D and this T sound basically the same. Pudding, pudding. The main difference that I hear for words like this, another example would be like um, batter and batter. The main difference is that because this has a D, a voiced sound, then my vowel should be slightly longer than in this one that just has a flap T, which is also voiced, but my vowel is shorter. So I would tend to say batter and batter. Um, same thing, pudding and pudding. Um, context is usually what's going to tell you which word is which. If I'm saying too much of a D sound in this word, pudding, with a really um, buildup of air, a louder and more forced D, um, it's not going to sound correct. I'm pudding on my shoes. But I can say I'm eating pudding, pudding. Um, I can use a true D here and it will sound okay. Um, so the thing to watch out for when you're using that flap T is that the vowel before it is somewhat short and the T is very, the T slash D is very light when I'm lifting up for that sound. Um, but that's a great observation. Those are definitely um, very similar in pronunciation. Um, uh, we have a question about the word mischievous uh, when it's pronounced individually versus um, phrase. Um, so she's talking about, or he's talking about mischievous versus mischievous um, and uh, whether or not there's a rule to that. I would say um, a general um, trend or pattern, not necessarily a rule, is that when I'm using a word uh, to describe, it's definitely, it's not going to be stressed. So another example would be um, the word interesting. Um, if I'm saying that's an interesting idea, interesting, I'm condensing that down to three syllables, an interesting idea, and the length really comes on uh, idea. So this word isn't stressed, it's not as important, but um, if I, that's in, it's an interesting idea. But if I'm just saying it's interesting, then I might say it more like it's interesting, interesting. I have more length here. I'm using all four syllables. So the idea is, depending on how it's used, this word is more important and this word is faster. So same thing with he's very mischievous versus it, he was a mischievous boy. Um, it's about reducing the word that's not as important and not in the stress position. I'm not sure if I can think of other examples of that or if that's a general rule or more of a trend that happens, but I do think it has to do with stress and intonation. Um, great. Um, so let's see. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Muhammad is saying some people do not pronounce a letter which has double T. For example, they pronounce cotton, like cotton. Um, so we were just talking about that word cotton a few minutes ago in the class. And um, I think that you should mark the T sound. So you don't really want to completely eliminate it, cotton. Um, some people do that. There are some dialects where they really um, stop the air in the throat with that glottal stop. I would say that in overall standard English, it's helpful to learn how to make a stopped T sound where I'm not releasing the T. 
I do this also quite a bit at the ends of words and in connected speech. So I don't say it's hot out. I say it's hot out. That first one links and becomes a flap. And the second one, out, out, I'm stopping the air at my tongue. Um, if I get in the habit of stopping the air in the throat, out, it's hot out. It doesn't sound um, American. I don't, Americans won't perceive that as being a T sound versus when I lift to make the T, but I don't release it. It's hot out, hot out then Americans will hear it as though you said the T because that's how they do it. They don't even realize that they're not saying hot out. Um, and sometimes we do put a small T on, but in words like cotton, cotton, I would definitely recommend lifting the tongue for that T sound to make sure that it sounds, um, that people can perceive the word and perceive the T sound. Um, uh, question about the word dam, D-M, and why do, people spell it D-A-Y-U-M <laughs> in informal English. I haven't seen that before, um, but I'm guessing they're trying to reflect um, an exaggeration of the word where somebody would be saying damn, um, <laughs> and that's <laughs> um, an exaggeration or it's like an intentional sort of fake accent on the word um, to lengthen it. So they're making it two syllables and they're changing the a ah, to an A vowel. Um, so that's just one way they might be saying it. Um, back to our example of when we were talking about the word girl, people might also write that as girl, <laughs> and same thing, they're kind of exaggerating or um, trying to reflect in the spelling, a changed pronunciation that's kind of an American slang or um, uh, something that they like to use. So that would be my guess, not having seen that myself. I, that's, it's only a guess, but um, when I saw that spelling, I immediately thought of that particular type of pronunciation for that word. Um, question about listening to American podcasts and whether that's helpful for uh, acquiring the accent. Definitely. Um, I, what I like to recommend in terms of listening is if you can find a podcast where there's conversation happening, um, that tends to be useful. Of course, there are lots of podcasts about learning English as well. Uh, but for accent, um, the one thing to watch out for in um, something like a podcast or a news um, broadcast is that sometimes people's intonation is a little bit different when they're um, talking about a topic or telling a story. Um, so you can definitely hear what's happening for pronunciation. You can imitate it. You can listen and get used to being surrounded by that American sound. Very useful for that. Um, just watch out for, depending on the podcast, you may hear some intonation patterns that aren't the same as how you would be talking when you're communicating and talking in a conversation. That might even happen in my class here because I'm talking and reading your responses. I'm not responding in conversation, but I try to speak in a conversational way as much as possible. Um, in a podcast, you might be hearing, um, you can probably notice it more in the news where you're gonna hear kind of strange intonation patterns um, as they're delivering the information, there's, there's kind of a typical news uh, intonation that isn't really used for actual speech. But yes, definitely, I recommend whatever you can listen to for podcasts, uh, watching movies, watching television, and especially listening for um, things where there's a conversation, real conversation between people is going to really help you with your American accent. Great um, question. Um, so uh, back to the mischievous, she was talking about mis mischievous and mischievous plan. Um, uh, so m mis mischievous and mischievous, n mischievous plan. Uh, I don't agree with that um, mischievous. Uh, I think that miss is stressed in both cases for me. So, um, I, you know, you may sometimes find information in a dictionary that reflects something that isn't done or people have different opinions about how that works. Um, uh, I would say that we, I would say mischievous. Um, if I'm saying the word by itself, the chi vowel changes and I'm lengthening on that. So um, he's mischievous um, versus it was a mischievous plan um, has first syllable stress. Um, yeah, so there is a stress change, but um, that's, that's how I would say it, basically what I was describing before. Um, 
Uh, Sheridan says he can't find my videos on intonation. Um, so I'm going to show you where those are. And um, daily exercises to improve on intonation. Um, yes, definitely. I would say imitating is very useful, kind of building from a more basic um, listening for what word is held longer and trying to follow pitch patterns that you hear um, when you're listening to TV. Um, on speechmodification.com, I mean, on our channel page, Speech Modification, just go down to the bottom where you see the playlists and you'll see that um, there's a playlist for intonation um, right here called American Intonation, and then there's 24 videos there. So that'll walk you through kind of some of the basics for imitating intonation and give you some ideas for how to build that. Um, and I would say just imitating at first, tuning into what you're doing. Um, you already are using a lot of American intonation probably, but maybe not quite familiar with what the rules are there, or what's happening. Um, getting more comfortable with imitating, following the ups and downs, and learning about the stress patterns is, is where I would start for daily practice. As you go, you're gonna kind of be able to build more and more skills and I'll make other recommendations for that practice. Um, uh, yes, so um, uh, we have a question. Trying to mimic the American way of speaking. Um, you're welcome, Sheridan. But um, they say I sound weird. Help me try to get weird get rid of that weird way. Um, okay, well, <laughs> hard to know exactly um, what you're doing that people are tuning into that's sounding weird, but um, I, I, I usually tell people if you're imitating, um, you're mostly not gonna sound weird. It might seem weird to you because of not being used to how that sounds, um, but um, if people are telling you that, um, if it's a native speaker, ask them to be more specific. Ask them to tell you what sounds strange to them. And um, another thing that I would suggest for anyone working on their accent, um, especially when you're trying imitating, is to um, record yourself. And not only your own voice, but whatever it is that you're imitating, maybe you're using one of my videos, maybe you're using a TV show, uh, maybe you're using some of the recordings on my website that walk you through. Um, turn on your recording tool. I like to just use one on my phone. Um, and then play the model. So turn on my tool, turn on Christine's video, she's talking, pause, imitate what you heard, and then stop your recording so that you can listen to first the native speaker and then yourself. And so then you can sometimes hear you can definitely hear more in a recording of yourself than you can hear when you're just speaking. And you can also hear, okay, Christine says, how are you? And I say, how are you? Or whatever it might be, whatever you're working on, you can hear more easily what the difference is between what you're doing and what it is that you're trying to imitate. This kind of technique is something that I talk about and teach you how to do in my online courses. And we talk about it in this class as well. But um, for many people going and checking out um, the, my courses page on speechmodification.com, if you can learn to imitate and learn to hear what's happening in your own speech more easily, you'll find that that's a super useful tool for taking advantage of all these other resources that I'm talking about. Um, so I would recommend starting with my six week course because it walks you through how to record yourself, how to imitate, how to listen, and begin to break down that filter where you can't tell if something sounds different or something sounds weird to where you can start to hear it more easily. Um, you can also use the free screening on my website. Um, so I have, I do offer on speechmodification.com a screening tool where you can record your speech and send it to me and I'll tell you what I hear. Um, if I do hear something that sounds weird, I'll tell you, but for the most part, I'm guessing I won't. I'll just be able to tell you more likely what it is that you're doing. So check that out here on the free screening. Um, it's just a great way to get a little bit of feedback and some direct information about what's happening in your speech, which is something I can't provide here on YouTube, unfortunately, because I can't hear you. Um, but I do appreciate you asking your questions and being part of class. So thank you, everyone. Um, Great, okay, so um, that was our topic today for, we got through the first couple steps of talking about difficult words. So finding out the correct pronunciation, 
and then beginning to break down the word and then build it back up using spelling it a new way, using working on the more difficult sound first and then building it into a longer, um, more the real context of the word. What we didn't talk about yet is how to take those words once you can say it and begin to bring it into your speech. So we'll talk about that again next time. And also next time I'd like to look at some more examples of difficult words and that process of breaking them down and learning what's happening in them and then rebuilding them together. So we'll talk about this topic again next week. We'll be meeting on Friday at the same time. I hope you can join me then. If you're watching this um, after the fact, please feel free to leave your questions in the comments and I'll make sure to get back to you with those answers. And take advantage of those tools on my website for the free screening, checking out the online courses. They all have a free trial. So you can see if you like that online learning, if you like the resources that you have there. And keep coming back to class and asking your questions because it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for being a part of class today. I'm Christine Dunbar from speechmodification.com. Remember, if you want to sound American, you can do it. Speechmodification.com.